Keep it where it, where it was. Or you can get back whatever you want, but if, just when you're talking about it for the sake of the film, if you keep the paper down, it won't be in oh, the okay. frame. Yeah, just get it. Oh. But you just look up at me and, and talk okay. about it yet. So okay. we'll get back to the uh, kid by the wall. Yeah, so low, and then and talk about Lower East Side, that's good. Should, should I go back to the, the wall? Sure. Okay, going back to uh, Hoppy Loves, whatever, I forget what the name was, but I just referred to it as the blur of uh, Kid Walking by the Wall, that photograph. That was taken on the Lower East Side, or it was called the East Village, whatever you want to call it during that time. That that was during my period of taking abstract, uh, when you, you call it abstract, or blur photographs during that time. And that influence came from basically uh, Alpha Nor, who was a member and a founding member of Kimongi, along with Sean Walker and Ray Francis and Lou Draper, Herb Randall. And the other photograph of the uh, swing that was also taken around the corner in the park from where I live. And Lou Draper used to come visit me when I lived on the Lower East Side. We would photograph in that park. In fact, Lou Draper stole some of my images. Okay, Lou? <laughs> His shop was better than mine. But we photographed in the same park because he would come and visit me and we would go around uh, the corner photograph in that park. And yet the one of the musicians, the two bass hit, that was taken, it seemed like I put everything around the corner from where I lived. This was taken around the corner from where I lived also. I lived on Avenue, uh, I lived on East 11th Street between Avenue A and between Avenue uh, B. And this photograph of the two bass hit was taken in a, a place called the cave and they had a parachute and hanging from the ceiling, so that was a backdrop of this photograph, the silhouette. And the bottom photograph here was taken in bed style, and a little kid was just playing on the curb with a puddle of water, and I took several shots of him doing that. And what about the one where he's um, drawing the uh, uh, numbers out, the circles around him? The similar one. Oh, right. That was, uh, I think, no, I was going to say it was the same kid, but no, it, was, it wasn't the same kid. That was taken in bed style also. And the kid was writing an A, B, C, C, D, and then in the end he said, and that ain't all. So that was uh, during my uh, kid period. And during that time, you could photograph kids. Today it's a little difficult, you know, because what are you going to put it on Facebook and the mother or grandmother look up and hey, boy, what are you doing? Don't let him take your picture. In fact, uh, I don't allow people to take photographs of my grandson. You know, I said, what are you going to do with the picture? You know, I feel a little guilty because, hey, man, all the pictures you've taken over the years, but it was a different time. And actually notice that Lou Draper's got a lot of photographs of children, too. Um, but it just seems, I mean, I just, is that just because kids were around, you know, you're out walking around the streets and that's just? Yeah, it was a boy of an innocent time with kids. And I have a photograph uh, it's not in, in this collection or whatever. I think it's seven kids, one, two, or three white, Hispanics, a whole mixture of kids taken on the Lower East Side. And that was a whole magical time with kids, and they were just standing there smiling, so I'm just kind of looking. But now it's, it's difficult to photograph kids like that. And someone who uh, saw my show at the, the Keep the Ellis Gallery, uh, mentioned my relationship with uh, Helen Levitt's photographs of the Lower East Side, which I don't think I, I'm honored, but uh, no. I was telling her that Helen Levitt's photographs of kids on the Lower East Side were very comical and funny, and especially uh, the ones with the kids up on the, the door sill and a whole lot of other stuff, and the kid pulling up the little girl's dress and blowing the bubbles. But my photographs of kids, uh, they're, they're kind of somber quiet and so, but I, I take it with, if I'm connected with Helen Levitt with photographs on the Lower East Side. In fact, I met her uh, years ago and she offered me the job, I think Sean was around there, took me to teach out at uh, Stony Brook or someplace, but it was too poor for me to go and I, 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 I couldn't make it. In fact, she came to my opening, my first one-man show at the Studio Museum in Harlem in 1972 and you know, we met then and we kind of became friends. And I just regret that I never photographed her because I knew how private she was. But I said, you know, you know, but I'm sorry, I didn't just sneak one photograph of her. But yeah, Helen Levitt, one of my favorite people. One photograph that she took, every time I photograph, every time I see kids blowing bubbles, 
I think of Helen Levitt, my grandson. I, I got him, you know, with blow bubbles. So every time I take a picture of him blowing bubbles, I say, Helen Levitt is looking over your shoulder, so you better make this a good photograph, you know. But that's my relationship with Helen Levitt. Yeah. So that's another interesting thing about the Black Dark Manual. I wanted to return to a couple questions. So I'll ask them both at the same time, and you can go, yeah, you can put that on the ground, that's fine. Um, you, can, you can answer however you want. One is the larger reason that you felt the need for the Black Photographer's Annual. And the second question is the fact that you, in every issue, maybe not the fourth volume, I can't remember, at least in the first three volumes, you always had women photographers, which... Always had what? Female, women photographers were included oh. in the annual, um, and. It was a difficult time for women photographers as, as well. So, and just wanted if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. It seemed like that was a very conscious decision you made at the time. Well, not really. But I didn't say, well, we need women photographers. And I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't say that. It's fine. We just sent out invitations to all the black newspapers and said, and, and word of mouth, and then that's how we got the photographers. But with the uh, fourth annual, I told Joe that with the advent of Women's Live, et cetera, et cetera, I said, Joe, we need a, a female on the selection committee. And not at Sean Walker's expense, though. But that was <laughs> Sean Walker. See, I'm the last man standing, so I can kind of say anything so that nobody can back disprove it. But anyway, uh, uh, let's see. Oh, I suggested uh, Jean Matusame Ash. I, Joe got in touch with her. I don't know what happened and she was busy, but he chose uh, another woman who was, the, with the, she was the editor of Scholastic Magazine. So she was the, uh, the female editor on our last volume. But I, was, I did make the conscious, conscious decision of that, that we needed a female editor. But as far as female photographers, it never entered my mind. We just sent out invitations and female women, you know, they. Supply work. And one of the, uh, oh, and uh, one, uh, one woman I wanted to write the uh, introduction or uh, comment was, uh, God, she worked for Essence, Diane of uh, 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 Weathers. But somehow uh, Joe didn't, you know, like the article that she wrote, so she wasn't used. So that's my only input as far as getting women involved with the annual. And yeah, you had um, well, well, that's interesting you brought up submissions because um, I think it was Essence Magazine that ran an article when you published the first volume. And they said there were 2,500 submissions or something. There was a huge number of, the, of works that were submitted that you chose from. And so I've been curious since then exactly what you just explained. What, what was the submission? process like? Did you put ads in magazines for people or was it just a call? Like, a, How did you circulate the call for submissions? Okay, we circulated the call by putting the, uh, the uh, information out in black publications. As I mentioned earlier that Joe Walker, he was a writer for Mohammed Speaks, so he was the PR man for all of that. He knew the connections who worked with what newspaper, what magazine, etc., etc. So he basically handled uh, that end. Now, as far as the, uh, now Sean Walker, when he comes on, he could probably uh, add more uh, disputes, not dispute, but disagree with how a certain process went along. But it really boiled down to the editors of the annual, including, you know, Sean or whatever. But the final call was really left up to uh, Joe Crawford and I. Matter of fact, uh, Joe Walker, may you rest in peace, he's passed away about 10 years ago. He tried to submit some photographs in the annual under someone else's name. He said, oh yeah, but so, so Joe and I, we looked through them and said, no, this doesn't make it, uh, Joe, Joe Walker. So he said, well, yeah, those are my photographs. We said, what? You tried to submit photographs? <laughs> so we were always honest. We didn't do any favors except with this, and Sean uh, uh, backed me up on this. The editors, we chose our own photographs. Sean didn't pick out my photographs. I didn't pick out Sean's. And, no, that was our privilege, cachet, or whatever you want to call it. We uh, picked out our own photographs. And that's how, and what point I don't recall, I was able to do my Martin Luther King essay, Assassination of 
Martin Luther King asked us. Nobody never, they wanted, nobody wanted to touch that. Because in the end, there's a photograph of a man in burning a silhouette. It was called The Fire Next Time, before James Brown, what's going on now, being popular. I wanted to name it that then. But so we chose our own photographs. But other than that, we did no favorites, uh, you know, nothing for the girls. Uh, no, it was, it, was, it was straight up, no favorites went on there. So let's talk a little bit about why you felt there was a need for the black diaper. Right, you did say it. Yeah. I have a tendency to go yeah, around the block. Yeah, you're great. This yeah. is wonderful. Well, as, as I said, with the uh, annual, with the photographers in the group, and other black photographers I knew, but basically Kamongi members, that we weren't being published. So I said, we have to do it ourselves. And that was the reason for the black photographers annual. I, I can't be more explicit than that. You know, I'm not a man for a lot of words, basically. But once I get going, you know, I, I got to take the horn out of my mouth. But uh, I hope I answered your question. I think so. Uh, I think that's pretty clear. Um, it was also simultaneous with the Black Arts Movement happening at large. So I'm wondering whether Joe Walker and Joe Crawford were perhaps involved in some of those networks, and that's part of um, part of the literary. No, not really. See that. See Joe Crawford, Joe Walker, and I. We were. I've always been sort of like a lone wolf in the sense. I went to openings and I do my stick my head in the door, the feet in the door to, to get through, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But we were all low key people. So that. But Joe Crawford, he got all the exhibits going at the Cochrane in Russia, in France, he was doing all that. And as I mentioned earlier, Joe was not a photographer, so he just had a love for photography. And the, the whole uh, concept of what I had for the annual. Okay, so it wasn't, but his, he wasn't involved in a literary way with- No. Or, but what about Joe Walker, who was that? No, Joe Walker, he wrote for the uh, answer, uh, Mohammed speech, that's kind of a radical, that's, Right. You kind of step back with something like that back during that time, to a certain extent, as far as museum of modern art goes. But in fact, uh, I'm, I'm jumping again. But included in the archives, I gave you there's a letter from John Sikowski, where I gave John Sikowski one of the black photographers, and I think the first one he wrote a, a you know a letter complimenting us on the annual, etc. So, so we were part of it in that sense. Can you talk a little bit about? I interpret one of the missions of the Black Photographers Annual being to honor the legacy of previous black photographers like Van Der Zee and P.H. Polk, and then the younger generation like uh, Roy Crop and Gordon Parks. But um, can you tell me a little bit about how the, the second volume features a great interview with P.H. Polk and a portfolio of his works? Can you tell me a little bit about that? How you met him and the decision to start including older photographers? Well, we met <coughs> uh, Mr. P.H. Polk through Chester Higgins. Chester Higgins got in touch with us and told us that, you know, there's a photographer in Tuskegee we should know about, that said we should take it from there. So Joe Crawford got in touch with Mr. Polk. In fact, Joe Crawford did the interview of Mr. Polk. He went down to Tuskegee, took some pictures. So, in fact, we, uh, Joe and I, uh, Mr. Polk and I became pretty, pretty close friends. And in fact, we did two exhibits of Mr. Polk's work. One was at the Studio Museum, and one was at the Alum Gallery in Washington, D.C. And uh, let's see, what else about Mr. Polk? Oh, and I did some printing. I made about five prints for Mr. Polk's show at the Studio Museum. In fact, I, I used, I, I, he had four by five negatives, and I didn't have a four by five uh, enlarger, but there was a photographer next door named uh, Curtis Brown. He had a four by five enlarger, so I used his enlarger to print about five or six of Mr. Pope's prints for the uh, uh, show at the studio, studio Museum that the uh, black photographers annually curated. So thanks to Chester Higgins, yes. we met Mr. Pope. And another question I have. So I noticed that there was never a fifth volume, but one thing that's really interesting to us with the Lewis Draper papers 
um, is we have an interview between Lewis Draper and um, Morgan and Marvin Smith, the Smith brothers. And Lou had written across the top that it was for the fifth volume of the Black Photographer's Annual. Do you, was there any yeah, plan? You, you mentioned that to me several times, and I have no knowledge of that because we knew that there wouldn't be a fifth volume. In fact, uh, Joe, I think he, he, he did the portfolio instead. He eased the portfolio in of, I think it was 10 prints, which I had nothing to do with. That was all Joe's special project. So there was there wasn't going to be a fifth annual. Maybe that was uh, Lou's imagination, or hopefully wishing for it, but there was never an intention for it because the quality of work was going down. Yeah. And but, yeah, they would have been an interesting, after having interviews with Polk and Van Der Zee, that would have been an interesting, it, it made sense to me that they were, that he thought of them as next in line right. for an interview, but. But one person that's missing in this, who I thought was a great photographer, Mr. Skirlock. Mm -hmm. Mr. Skirlock's son came to my loft and he brought Mr. Skirlock's photographs and we were overwhelmed. The exquisite work, his work is, is well, I don't want to say better than a certain, a certain photographer, but his work was is exquisite. I would rank Mr. Skirlock's work with any of the so-called gods of photography, white establishment photographers during his time. You've seen his work. And I, I think he has some in the, uh, the, the courtroom, permanent prints. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, so don't quote me on that. But uh, you should get in touch with, I think his son passed. I, I'm not sure, so I don't know who has Mrs. Skirlock's work. But his work is exquisite. Mm -hmm. So he was a missing link in all that. And I think his work was different from Mr. Van Der Zee's, Mr. Polk's. Mm -hmm. His was more technically, he had more of a, a technical finesse in his work. Not saying anything that was wrong with Mr. Pope or Mr. Vanity, mm -hmm. but as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Skirlock, his work had a certain finesse and quality, exquisite. Mm -hmm. his, his work was exquisite. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, oh, Gordon Parks. Yeah. I had nothing to do with that. Uh, uh, Joe Walker got in touch with Gordon Parks and Joe Crawford photographed, I think, yeah, he took some pictures of Going parts. So we're starting to near the end of our time. I, I want to talk a little bit about your. I just want to at least record that your role um, as a president of Komoike in the past, and then also a little bit about the title because um, everybody has different stories for where the name Komoike comes. And Luke Draper, sure, yeah. <laughs> John Terry, we're going to get. I'm asking the same question because. It seems like there's a consensus on Al Pinar having named the group, but Lou Draper in his paper thinks he named the group. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you could talk a little bit about, well, you, I guess you were there at the beginning of the group. That's right. You were, you came a couple years afterwards. So we'll ask Sean about that. But um, anyway, that's, talk about being president. Okay, well, uh, get, get back to the name of Kamongi. From my knowledge of the group, I came in in 65. Alpha Nor named Kamongi. Now, Sean can dispute it, not dispute it, but correct me or whatever. Uh, several years ago, Unfoco, a Hispanic group, did a tribute to Kamongi. I was the president then. So I said, okay, I'm going to settle this once and for all. Who named Kamongi and what role did Roy Dika Robert have in this? Because in, in so many publications, Roy Dika Robert is down as the founder of Kamongi. Okay, you disagree with that. that that's I mean, I've heard that that's not the official story. Right, you so, tell me the official story. Right, so I said, okay, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I interviewed every member of Kamongi during this time. I said, call them up, but they didn't respond. That was on them. The article mentions Alpha Nor was being the one who named Kamongi, and also the Roy Dika Robert was not the founder, uh, not, he didn't start it, he came in later on. Now, Ray Francis met Roy Dika Robert in Central Park. Roy Dika Robert was photographing in Central Park. Ray, uh, Ray Francis saw this photography, went over to him and introduced himself. And that's how Roy Dika Robert 
got involved with the monkey because Ray Francis was part of another group, Sean would know more detail than Camera 35 or something like that. And that's how Roy came into the picture. So I think I answered that. And one more thing, I'm kind of jumping with the article. Uh, I want to get to the article in, uh, uh, was it after? This the Lens Blog, yeah, the New York Times Lens Blog piece? No, that's oh. the, the magazine. Oh, on Carla Williams' uh, article on the annual. The yes, I'll yeah. save some space for that, but okay, okay, let me go back to the trail. Okay, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted you to make sure you talk about Roy D. Carver's apartment. Well, or studio. Roy D. Carver's. Oh, okay, right. That was in 1972. Uh, yeah, uh, Roy was moving to uh, Brooklyn, and he was selling his law. So the first person he called was Ray Francis. Because Ray Francis, as I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, Ray Francis met Roy in Central Park, so they became friends. So he called Ray Francis, uh, told him that uh, you know he was leaving his law, that he would, would he like to purchase, and Ray Francis know he had his apartment. So the second person on the list was me because Roy and I became friends. In fact, I was referred to as Roy's boy in the group because there's always you know factions of different groups in, in any organization. So I was referred to as Roy's boy. So quite naturally, he would call me. So I, he said he was selling the law for a thousand dollars, and I had to hustle up a thousand dollars. So I purchased Roy's law. He moved to Brooklyn. And so that's how I, and I was there from 72 to, uh, let's see, 70, maybe 85 or something like that. I gotta go to my no notes. And then I bought a brownstone in Brooklyn. But I passed the law on to, this is history no one seems to talk about. Maybe it's because they keep, I, I don't know why. I sold the law to Frank Stewart, Jeannie Matusame Ash and uh, Gerald, uh, Jules Allen, those three. Now, when I sold them, I think I, I sold them like a thousand dollars. I didn't, I didn't make a profit. We was all friends, and I couldn't let the landlord know. I oh boy, this is gonna come back and bite me. I couldn't let the landlord know I sold the law. I told him that my uh, cousin was moving out. If he had known it was Jeannie Matusame Ash, he would say what? He was, then he was skyrocketing around. I was paying a hundred and twenty-five, uh, tw oh yeah, I was paying, no, Roy was paying a hundred dollars a month when he got the law. When he left, which was in 72, the rent was a uh, hundred and twenty-five. So when I got the law, uh, I was still paying Roy's amount, hundred twenty-five dollars a, a month for the law. So, uh, okay, that's, that's the, uh, I, I think maybe I'll answer that for yeah. And where was that lost again? What was your 138th Street and 6th Avenue. 38th Street. Uh, um, thank you, uh, Sean. In fact, uh, uh, Sean, just correct me, 138th, I mean, uh, 38th Street and uh, 6th Avenue. The address was 1015, and Sean had a walk two doors down from me. He moved in. I don't know what year that was. Same time. 79. Okay. No, same time. 72. 72, when Jimmy moved out. Oh, okay, same same time? Yeah. Oh, okay, so during that time. That's great. So 72, you take Roy Carrava's loft, Sean moves in, and then we'll get Sean to talk about all of the neighbors who oh, all lived in. One, one other thing, I want to mention that Lou Draper, getting back to me, becoming president, yeah, pull me back into that because I'm wandering off to something else. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what kind of time we got here. Well, we should probably shift. Yeah, one turned at one, so we should about about we should shift pretty soon to Sean to get his right. his interview in. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, well, yeah. So we were talking about you as president, and now now I had a, another question that I forgot about. But we talked about the Kamoye title. If you could, if uh, you could talk a little bit, maybe more generally about.